Joel mentioned a moment ago that he made a value judgment about design. I want to point out to you how rare that is in the developer world where they make economic decisions about design. So the type of firm that Joel has founded with his partners, Landmark Companies, is a design-driven, design-led development firm. Unlike just to pull a random example out of the air, Avalon Bay, which is a real estate investment trust designed to create income, and they bring their formula to your town and say, here's what we do. What Joel does, in an enlightened fashion, is look at each site individually, and he uses his values as an architect, his training, his experience, as a resident of Princeton and walking around Palmer Square of the years he spent traveling in Europe and looking at communities that have a history of great civic life and engagement and he brings that knowledge to bear on the design and he creates a design and then he finds a way to make it work economically. That's very progressive and enlightened and we need more people like that in New Jersey. Okay, uh, while I set up the, the, the changes back, if you want to get some coffee, I'm going to raise up the screen and get a little daylight in here. We're going to have you tell us a little bit. I'm going to tell you what the recommendations of the parking study were. We want to get some of your feedback on them. Someone had their hand up? Or so? Can I, can I, um, okay, so, or do you want to just um, let us get rejiggered and we'll start? Maybe, yeah, All right, let's do that. Two minute break. I have, I have a few things to say um, that may not be all that popular in this room. Just as a uh, quite all right. Yeah, I don't think so. Now they want to hear. That's right. Uh, so I really, I really love the idea. Would you uh, do us a favor and just stand because we're actually recording this and we're going to put this on our website. So if you don't mind, if we have your permission. <laughs> um, I really love the idea of designing for requirements, but uh, I think we are not thinking about the requirements in the right way. It is my opinion that we are living in these decades at a time of peak calm. And so we uh, run the risk that if we design for the, the parking requirements today, our buildings will be obsolete in less time than you would think. Uh, I mean, autonomous vehicles are making a real rise. Uh, they will change our, our, the way we move around and the way we park in significant ways. And we need to plan for that now. I mean, the people who calculate these things say that autonomous vehicles can either reduce our carbon emissions from transportation by up to 70%, which is great, or it can increase our emissions from transportation by 150%, depending on how we plan for these autonomous vehicles. So, for instance, we could easily share these vehicles we have the technology, we could have routeless buses that will pick you up and drop you, just like city buses, but they have no set routes. It's like a cross between Uber and a city bus, basically. Or we could each own an AV, uh, come to the library and set our AV to walk, you know, drive around town by itself without parking, thereby leading to congestion and emissions and all that stuff, and it will help nobody. So what I think we should do is try to look ahead a little bit uh, at that possibilities, also including uh, the desires of the millennials who are vastly underrepresented in this room right now, uh, who grew up in, on the back seats of either dad's car or mom's car, because both mom and dad have a car, and who have sworn that their children will not grow up like that. They are going to live in town, work in town, shop in town. And a lot of them aren't even interested in getting a uh, driver's license. So you need to be aware of these changes. 
uh, I know that we need to build to today's demand because after all, you have to make a living off of what you're doing. Uh, but just the fact that our buildings hopefully live for longer than a decade uh, requires us to think forward. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has just put a stop on all new parking mm, construction in London. That is the kind of forward-looking thinking that we need in this town also. Yeah. Now, you started out by saying that would be unpopular, but I don't get that sense in the room. No, you're exactly correct. Um, and um, the, the, the problem we face is how do we recalibrate our perceived parking demands in light of all the things you just cited. So the study that the Municipality Commission has six suggestions for us to do that. Number one, rebalance parking demand. So what that means, in light of what we said earlier, that even at peak demand, Thursday at 1 or Saturday at 7, there's close to 50% available spaces in the community that are essentially unknown. So we have to rebalance that demand so people can understand what's available. Number two, reduce demand, and that goes to what you were speaking about through various improving technologies, through improvements of mass transit, through bike share, through car share, even things that we have available to us today, such as a zip car or Lyft or Uber. Uh, these are ways we can reduce demand. Number three, we need to optimize parking management. So we don't actually have parking management in the community in a dynamic way undertaken by a specific staff every day. We have our municipal staff who works very hard, and this falls in the laps of the engineering department to try to manage not only the study, but suggested improvements and changes to parking regulations, and we have some great guys working in the parking garage who take care of it and walk around and collect the money. We don't actually have a mastermind of parking thinking to spend all day long trying to take us to a place we want to get to but don't so far know how to do that. We need to expand our effective capacities. So this speaks to what David brought up, which is we have a lot of capacity. We have these 7,000 spaces in the community. 70% of them are on private lots that aren't maximum utilized. So, for example, down on the corner of McLean and um, Witherspoon, Mount Pisgah has eight spots behind their church. And um, they're highly used Sunday morning, <coughs> right? During the weekdays, they're empty. At night, there are two cars in there. My truck and the woman downstairs, her car. And otherwise, that parking lot is empty all week long. Mount Pisgah could, if it participated in a program that connected to a knowledge system in the municipality, put those spaces out for short-term use throughout the weekday or through the evenings at a significantly lower rate, at a perimeter rate to the central core of the community, and Mount Pisgah could make some money, and we could add eight spaces to our inventory. It's just a management issue. The spaces are already built. They're there waiting to be used. We need to improve the residential parking experience. We need to change the permit system that's presently in place in neighborhoods. Uh, it's, uh, it's somewhat, well, it's very arcane. It's a little bit arbitrary. There's waiting lists which are <coughs> arbitrarily derived of capacities. And sadly, when all else comes unglued, you call up the police and say, can I please leave my car overnight on the street? And the police say, yes, sure, what's your license plate number? But they really don't want to be bothered with this because this is not their problem. So we need to fix that. And we need to update the zoning code, which acknowledges a lot of the new developments in transit and personal vehicular use of whatever sort, and along the lines that Joel outlined in Rawway, where people who want to redevelop their property have options. They can provide their parking on site. They can pay for parking somewhere else. They can pay into a parking improvement district, and the funds are used to improve parking throughout the community. 
But wait, we have a lot of parking, so really what we could do is improve how you are able to access parking throughout the community and how you're able to um, pay for that. So that's a quick summary. Mary. Mary has been super helpful today writing down comments for us. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Uh, so it's the state it's the state that requires that you have one point whatever number of parking spaces per who requires that? So each town adopts their own zoning ordinance and their requirements per each individual zone of how the parking works. So certain zones in Princeton have a requirement for residential, have a requirement for commercial. Uh, the restaurant requirement is different than the sewing notion store requirement. And uh, so there are uh, government adopted standards and the standards are created by private engineering entities who say, you know, this is what we recommend for everyone. Um, candidly, those are always behind the times and are always published in a textbook from 1974 and, and outdated. And now things change dramatically from year to year. So really an experience like Joel's experience in real time providing parking for residents of Rawway should be more important for us to listen to than those standards. But they are adopted locally, Mary. So it's all flexible? Yes. You can make whatever. Absolutely. This municipality, the elected officials in this municipality may adopt any regulation they see fit to provide for parking in existing and new redevelopment projects. It's entirely locally controlled. Is the consultant recommending? Actually, yes. Uh, well, not specifics, but, you, but I can bring that up for you, V. Uh, actually, I don't have that image. It's in the report. They suggest um, a, uh, what was it called? A Parking credit system. Yeah, it's a system where a developer can, has to meet a score. So instead of providing 10 spaces, you have to get a score of, let's say, 15. And you get a certain number of points for providing private space on site. You get more points for providing a space on site that's shared throughout the community. You get some amount of points for paying into a fund that the community can use for neighborhood improvements, streetscape improvements, other parking improvements throughout the community. You get, um, there's actually penalties in the ranking system. If you want to provide excess parking on your development, it actually goes against your score. Um, you can find all this information. Personally, I think it's a great idea, but that's personal. David. Um, I probably should know the answer to this, but um, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, upgrades to the permit system? And I'll ask you the specific question, which is, um, I thought I heard the consultant say that they were going to recommend that permits be required for on-street parking throughout the town, um, throughout the municipality. And did I misunderstand that? Are they just talking within the study area? Or are they really talking about the entire community? Uh, no, you did not misunderstand. So there's really two key elements, in my opinion, that the consultant recommends. One key element is a, a completely rebuilt new system to pay for parking in the community at the meters and at the garage and actually for residents. And that would be an uh, intelligent meter, a really smart meter, that can tell if the space is occupied, that can take your credit card, pay by your smartphone, can take coins if you want to put coins in, can pretty much take whatever payment method we can come up to. And this meter will uh, have a Wi-Fi connection to a centrally managed system which has the following data. If you register, it'll have your license plate. And instead of getting a permit for your neighborhood and sticking a little piece of paper on your windshield, it recommends this report moving to a license plate recognition system so that parking enforcement team of people riding around in the Cushmans can read your license plate and say, ah, this car has a resident permit that allows this resident to park all day long on uh, Green Street, because they live on Green Street, and they've been given 24-hour permission to do that because this poor person actually doesn't have a parking space in their house, and the system of permits would allow for that condition. The uh, meters can also tell if the town purchased the right ones. Unfortunately, they're the most expensive ones. But 
hopefully price will come down. And I've spoken to engineering staff. They are actively investigating this right now, and they're going to bring to council some you know, proposals to implement this quickly. We obviously can't do it town-wide at once, but we need to get started. So this also, if we get the really high quality system, the meter will tell when the space is empty, right? So then we can have real-time information on where spaces are available throughout the community. So through your little Princeton parking app, you can see, oh my goodness, parking on um, Witherspoon Street between uh, Quarry and Lee is, there's like two cars on the whole street, and then you could even further someday, when you develop some data, employ dynamic pricing. Okay, so one thing this consultant suggests is that those 28 levels of parking restrictions over time be erased. <coughs> and you pay for parking on essentially a supply and demand sort of condition. So that it's more expensive on Nassau Street and Palmer Square, they recommend $2 an hour. As you move off of those red line core super occupied zones, the ones that are 60 to 80% capacity, it drops to $1.50 an hour. And then when you get out to the periphery, it's a dollar an hour. But dynamic pricing can actually allow you to say, well, you know, from uh, seven, well, five, I'm just making this up. They didn't recommend this, okay? From 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., Nassau Street is in such high demand, you can charge $3 an hour.
Yes. Yeah. Except for in a parking meter. You raised it. I live on Van Deventer. Yes. Um, and we have two spaces directly across. We have two spaces directly across the street from us. I think it's a dollar an hour right now. If you raise that to three dollars, where right. do my guests so, park? So the report recommends that residents be allowed to have visitor permits. And the visitor permits are priced on an as-need basis. The report recommends, I believe, it's thirty dollars a month for a resident parking permit in your neighbor. No, um, a quarter. It was it was it was thirty dollars if you don't have on-site parking. If you have no parking, if you have no parking, lot. the first permit is thirty dollars a year. A year. And then, if you want a second permit. Or if you have on-site parking, it's thirty dollars per quarter, and the guest permit was ten dollars a week, if I remember correctly, and that was more for. Here's the chart, everybody. If you can see it. Now, look. This is just a consultant's recommendation, so I don't want you to get too hung up on the pricing, except to realize you can determine the pricing. But the pricing. I mean, it's it's literally too high. Thirty dollars a year is too high. Quarter. Well, when you say it, it would be for a visitor. I mean, I have parking in my driveway. So I have friends coming over for supper. They, they're going to come at 5 o'clock. All right. The and salient point here, Tina, month. without getting into the weeds on how much, is that you can set the pricing based on demand. It's the rates not set at this point. You can, you can create a pricing strategy that fluctuates seasonally throughout the time of day, throughout the day of week. Resident buys a permit, you know, the, the idea is that you have the opportunity and the flexibility with some understanding that people who have no parking on their site are at a greater penalty yes. than people who have one spot on their site who are slightly more penalized than people who have two spots on their site. And actually the report suggests if we use license plate recognition system and you have one permit on the street and one on your lot, you could actually let your visitor use your street permit and you simply enter that in your app as part of the way the system manages how that piece, how that permit's allocated. But this requires a sophisticated management system that we do not presently have in place. Jim. Yeah, I'm um, thank you. This is really fascinating. I'm here on behalf of somebody who's working on parking issues at another municipality, and she said, I don't go to Princeton, it's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait, wait, well, that, that website, uh, Wallatop, seemed to confirm that, didn't it? <laughs> so. uh, I, okay, uh, one quick question that is answerable. Um, in that study, is there a report that, that describes the the difference in income from fines and from um, meter parking post uh, meter feeding scandal. No. <laughs> That's something I would like. The report actually doesn't uh, talk about the money that the municipality makes on parking. But I was actually a little curious, so I did a little research. Um, does anyone care to guess how much income Princeton presently and David and Joe are excluded from this question, so they know the answer. How much Princeton presently receives today, with none of this in place, through parking annually? 100,000. 100,000. Bill? A quarter of a million. 500,000. 500,000. Jim? How much? 3 billion. Jim's is 3 million. So if this is the price is right, and Jim ran, he's cleaning up. 2% of the total revenue. $4,345,000. <laughs> 7.5% of your municipal budget is paid for by parking. Now, the following things make up this. I just want you to know. Um, meter bags bring in 51000 Smart cars in the garage, $1,734,000 a year. That's a great street garage. That is cash cow for the community. Uh, rent, 30000 Pilots, payment in lieu of taxes, $672,000. So what that means is certain projects were approved that don't have parking. 
that essentially this money goes to maintaining the parking garage. It's kind of a backhanded system that this report is advocating we formalize. And the biggest example is right across the street, the Spring Street Apartments. They have no parking. That project does a payment in lieu of taxes to the municipal coffers, and that contributes to our parking utility. What's the cost? Cost of? The cost of getting the $4 million. Well, we spent uh, 8 or $9 million on the garage back in 2000. Does anyone remember the exact cost? I think it was $9 million. So if we're making a million seven a year and we're at year 20, we're doing okay. What's the annual Joe? Cost. We have personnel costs. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I see. Yes, no, Joe's right. We have personnel costs. We have garage costs. Um, uh, permits, parking permits generate $194,000 to the community. And the meters, you ready for this? How much do the meters make? $1,354,000. Of money, you're not paying property taxes. Yeah, but we're paying for people to come and enjoy our town. I understand. Okay. I'm not saying it's free. But Joe's pointing out there's a cost. I just want everyone to understand we already generate significant income in this community through parking management. What is the number for fines? The fines, I don't know. Fines are run through the traffic uh, police court budget, so I do not have that number. It's an important number. But I, I think, think that think money goes a, to the police budget. I don't believe that goes to support parking in the community. I think it's important to note that the, the recommendation of the consultants was to have fines go to zero. You know, the ideal is to get people to pay for the parking, but not to have them pay for disobeying parking rules. And so a lot of this stuff with the smart meters would be, you know, if you stay over your two hour limit, you don't get a ticket, the price goes up though by the hour, so it might be $2 an hour. I have them. one more comment that doesn't require an answer. Um, and Quick, Jim. And that is in the Riverside area, there are many houses that have many cars. There, there's uh, on street parking by people who are doing work um, that, get, that interferes with traffic, makes it very dangerous for the children who ride bicycles. My recommendation is that you have an incentive to put a paver on the, where the asphalt meets the grass um, so, that, so that cars are encouraged and workers are encouraged to put one wheel on that property without having to do a um, Okay, sidewalk. that's a good idea. Thank you, Jim. Yes, Con. Are there any, are there any towns right now that use a smart meter? I just don't know the answer. There have to be, but I just don't. Connie asked if there are any other communities that are using this smart meter. I mean, I have to assume, yes, they wouldn't be building these if there's no demand, but I can't honestly tell you the truth. Joe? Um, I think if you, if you can Google this, but I'm pretty sure uh, San Francisco's gone to yeah. kind of dynamic. Mm -hmm. San Francisco and Seattle, for sure. Well, yeah. Montreal there, has there are. Yeah, not quite as far Actually, as Princeton has a pilot program with a company called Possumus. And they, that, I don't think they've gotten that off the... No, but, well, but there was, a, I believe there was an agreement to do it. There was an agreement that hasn't, I don't think it's been executed. Yeah. So, so yeah, to, to follow up on what David just said, um, the, the consultant suggests that eventually we move to dynamic pricing where your first hour is very low priced. So if you want to come in, grab a cup of coffee, run over, buy some gelato or ice cream or whatever, and you're in and out in an hour, that's not terribly expensive. If you want to stay two hours, it goes up a bit. If you want to stay three, <coughs> four, five hours in that meter, then those hours three, four, and five, they're going to sock you. Because really, if you want to park that long, you should go park in the garage. Because the point of parking meters, ultimately, remember, is not to raise that one and a half million bucks, but actually to make turnover on the streets so merchants have the opportunity of people to come and go throughout the day to take advantage of their stores. Yes, sir, in the back. Sheldon, would you give him a mic? Yeah. Um, can I, can oh, I'm sorry. No, go, the, um, please forgive me. I'll come right back to you. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure I understand this slide correctly. I have a driveway at my house. Yes. So I have off street parking. Right. And can your driveway fit one car or two cars? Three. Okay. So. 
I'm Good. paying, what I'm saying is, I'm paying already for my parking in my taxes. Right. Right. So why I would pay more for a first permit than someone who doesn't pay any taxes for parking their cars, right? They're not paying for their parking yet. So they're going to use street parking for their car. Why I would pay more than they do, because I'm already paying for parking for three cars in my taxes, because I have that piece of So do you need a fourth car space? I guess. Okay. So you would be uh, able so to... Why I would be paying for... You, so you would be able to take advantage of uh, the visitor thing, which this report suggests they implement through this app, smart app or you would register the license plate of your visitor and pay just a one day little whatever that fee is one day, I don't know, three dollars or something, just for your visitor, just for the time that they're on the street. So you wouldn't need to buy one of these at all. I could move my car to the street. It would or, be free. Or you could put, put your car, you could get a permit for your car, put your car on the street, let the visitor take your second or third spot. And my car would be free on the street because I'm a resident who pays taxes. No. 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 Your car would be uh, $30 a quarter because so you would be a household is, with is Wall Street Park. Is my question dumb? Or, I'm just, do, do people see what I'm asking? No, I understand. Yes. Yes. You know it can't be, look, okay, this, I'm needs, just to, this I, needs to be worked out. And, yeah, and yeah. I get your point. And I think it's a great idea. I'm just trying to say, yeah, you guys get my data point on that. Totally get it. Yeah. And obviously the issue of what's fair and reasonable for residents needs to be ironed out. Essentially what the consultant is saying is create a supply and demand price-based system that can be managed in effectively real time, in daily time, to manage idea. this instead of 28 different regulations through various districts that you can't figure out and ultimately just call the cops to say, and I promise that gentleman back there the next question is, sir, you'll be next to the new uh, I live on one of the tree streets, yes. and non-residents just pack it from 8 a.m. Absolutely. Now till 6 p.m. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, so I I do I don't have a driveway, but I do pay for a permit, you know, above and beyond to to have one car available. Uh, there's one woman in the neighborhood who has been suffering from cancer. Uh, she has to. Uh, when she goes shopping, she has to uh, park her car, parallel park, put the her merchandise, and then look for another space. Another woman had bad knees, and same thing. Now she's she has a knee operation, but it's jammed, it's clogged, and and uh, uh, and so non-residents are there all day for free. And uh, let me just finish. Apparently, at one time. Pine and uh, uh, and Chestnut were wide open all day. Murray was wide open all day, uh, parking, and then gradually those streets <coughs> left two-hour parking. So so uh, uh, many of the residents we had both in Linden and in uh, on on Maple Street signed a petition, and a majority of the residents who even have. Uh, single-family homes and driveways said this is not fair so there's sort of a shutout of, of, uh, of for the for the residents and and the guest area is is another area so our petition was we love living in Princeton so and we love the walkability so we, we were looking for some kind of let's have two or three hour parking so that you do so. So I feel that this this kind of remedy would be uh, would be workable in 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 my situation. I I just wanted to respond um, to say a little bit about what the parking consultants recommended for those areas. So the permits um, they're suggesting would only be available to people who live on the street. And what they suggested, and I'm not sure this will get, adopt, be, get adopted or how exactly it would be workable, but that on a street-by-street -street basis, residents could determine what other parking was permitted besides permit parking. So in other words, the residents of Maple Street could have a house meeting and say, you know what, it's such a problem, we need our on on street spaces, 
we only want to allow permit parking on our street, no other parking whatsoever. Uh, people who live on Linden, you know, a couple of blocks away might say, well, that, you know, we don't have quite as much of a problem. We want to allow two hour parking on our street for people without permits in addition to the permit parking. So it could be a pretty fine grained um, solution so that streets in different parts of town, the ones that are most victimized by non-residents abusing and sort of parking all day, could really eliminate that problem. Um, the, the difficulty, of course, is if not every resident of the street agrees what the rules should be for non-permit holders, you might have some difficulty making those determinations. But that was the recommendation of the consultants. Yes, sir. Um, also, I also live on the Tree Street. I also live on the street in which it's packed from 9 to 5. And in fact, even though uh, my house has a driveway and space for a car, it's actually awkward to try to get out of the driveway because it's so densely packed, it's hard to see as one enters and exits the, the narrow driveway space. Um, and my concern is this. I, although I, I very much like the car management system, the consultants have laid out, it is a car management system. And what I find, it's very impersonal and doesn't really reflect the way I live, and I think most people live. I, you know, my, I, since I have enough space for my car, you know, what I need are people who come and visit me, and people who come and provide services for me. I need short-term permit parking for these people, and I need the spaces on the street to be more open, right? So, you know, uh, a day pass or a week pass, visitor pass, doesn't respond to my needs at all. You know, I'm, although one could purchase a long-term pass, I do feel a little bit like, like the, the, the lady who spoke earlier, that, you know, that's a solution. If, if you look at the big picture for car management, that makes sense, but it really doesn't correspond to the needs of the residents, I feel of my street and my neighborhood, which need a more immediate, flexi flexible, <coughs> human scale sort of solution to it. Uh, and if, if the smart, the smart uh, meters sound great, and perhaps we could use a paper system until the smart meters actually take effect so that we're not uh, waiting for technology to actually be rolled out. Understood. Uh, right here in front of you, Steve. Kevin, thank you for presenting all of this. Do you have more content you want us to see before we react, or are we in the full on no, no, react? No, we'll react. Because it's 20 and 12, okay. and there's way too much content. I, I really urge you to go and study the report. Um, I, I will say, in 10 years of mine looking at consultant reports to the municipality, this is one of the better ones I've seen. It's thorough, exhaustive, has some interesting recommendations. It'll be a challenge to implement all of this, some of this, but there's a lot of clear-eyed thinking here about stuff that we've just assumed for 20 years is a good. So then, then let me just give a couple of reactions. Sure. I, I tend to, to judge stuff like this on um, the basis of what were the design goals, what were the goals that were being, time, uh, that were being uh, attempted, uh, and then also um, what are the assumptions about the future? And I think to the, the commenter before, there are a lot of assumptions of the future that maybe they're explicit in the uh, in the report, but they didn't really come out um, here. This seems like a really sensible way to increase efficiency of parking, um, but I think at a macro level, increasing efficiency of parking uh, encourages more driving um, and more cars. It doesn't seem to, uh, I didn't see anything about what's the impact of, let's say, all the on-street parking on bicycling. Um, what's the impact, uh, or, What's the point of view of, do we want more people to arrive into the town by train? Um, or do we want more people to be able to drive? Do we want people to arrive in the town and, and park at the periphery? Or do we want them to be able to park as close to where they want to go as possible? So I just didn't get a sense of, of what we were trying to accomplish. And again, that sense of what we really believe in the way of the future in terms of autonomous vehicles and Uber and Lyft. You know, do we think it's going to have, oh, that's so far out, we don't really need to adapt to it yet. Um, or do we need to have a point of view on that and a vision towards that so that we can start taking steps in that direction? My question's related. So, so I, I, I fully understand. I, just, I do want to say that from the standpoint of the municipality, 
they have been advancing simultaneous goals on bike planning, bike sharing, Zagster bikes, and throughout the community. So this was sort of purposely myopic to look at what is our existing inventory and how could we better manage it. it they weren't attempting to exclude the larger issue you bring up. Those are issues for you to take to council and convince your elected officials of the balance of priorities across the board, which are most important to you as residents. Fair enough, thanks. Um, Excuse me, where, where would one find a list of all of these av potentially available uh, parking places in town and when they're available? So I'll, I'll repeat, you can find a copy of the report. Uh, it's in the report. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's, it's actually in the, the second section of okay. the six sections. Yeah. Marina. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam has the mic and then Marina. And then yeah, I'll come to you. And then I got to Jim. I just want to come back to that point about what the overall vision of what we're trying to achieve here is because you know it seems really important to me that you know we're we're going to get into these long debates about whether it should be thirty dollars a quarter or thirty dollars a year about parking. You know, meanwhile the ice caps are quite literally melting, and you know, you know, I think in, in like fifty years' time, people are going to look back at us talking about. $30 per quarter or $30 per year and ask us what on earth were we thinking about because really you know what we need to be thinking about in my personal opinion is starting to exclude cars from downtown Princeton because where you see the most valuable spaces in Princeton is where there are no cars like this plaza right out here used to be a surface parking lot as far as I know now we have this really high quality space. Palmer Square, where you can park, is also a high quality space. These are the things which add to the quality of life in Princeton, not whether you can park and get eight minutes grace period or 13 minutes grace period after the meter runs out. And I'll also point out you know, the bike plan, which you just mentioned, the bike plan that we just passed is a piece of garbage because everyone is too scared to touch parking, yeah. which means that you know we have made in this town a value judgment mm -hmm. that it is better for people to be able to park easily than it is for people to be able to bicycle into town safely. Or and I think I think that that is a very depressing place to be at. So you know what I would ask council when they're coming to decide how to implement. The recommendations of this plan. I do think there's a lot of good stuff in this plan. Try to keep some focus on the big picture. Hi, Hi. I'm the. Um, I live in Withers Street, Jackson, and I own a business near the Street Street. So I'm personally responsible for three street, three cars parked on the street. <laughs> from 7.30 to 6 o'clock. So I think for me, and I struggle with this, so one problem as a business owner, and I employ two millennials who cannot afford to live in town. And they both live in Plainsboro, and they, that's the only thing they can afford, and they commute and they stay in traffic on Route 1 for 40 minutes every morning, and we find it super frustrating, and we try to find apartments for them in town, and it's impossible. So I think one way to try to think about it is having, you know, I keep saying this, secondary units in people's homes, where if you guys had a secondary unit where my employee could live, and she could just walk to work, she wouldn't get into car accidents, it would be amazing. Um, I love that she's gone to two already. Um, another point I'd like to make, I, living in Witherspoon Jackson, I drive my kids to school, and then I park. Pine, you know, here are you guys. And I constantly think about, like, should I drive home, leave my car at home, and then walk to work? It is a 16-minute walk. I do it sometimes. But, you know, when the parking is free, for me to, you know, lose an hour, like, walking back, get my car, go get the kids, do all of this, when the parking is free, there's no incentive. And I'm one of those people who would love to do it. If there's some way for me to bike to uh, take my, and sometimes I'm a bit better if I put my kids to school, leave, you know, there, bike to work. But if there's a place, like maybe I leave my car in the school parking lot, get on the bike and get to you guys, 
I think what I'm getting to is that the consultant said that it's not car management, it's access management. So they try to say, like, you know, the parking on tree streets is expensive, then I won't do it. And then how do you, um, but the other thing that was mentioned here is they were saying that there were benefit districts, do you remember when they said that? That the money that would be made from the parking on your street would go to you, and then you can decide, maybe you get free snow removal from your sidewalk so that people could walk, you know, like benefits that people could get. So I think it's the key thing is they were saying, think about it as access management, rather than parking, and think about what benefits you want from the money that the town is really making. I have a kind of related question, and I do live on Pine Street. You can probably see my car. What I'm wondering about when we were talking about $30 a year or a quarter and all that stuff, uh, many of us in this room can afford that, but we have a population in our town that's, that's going to be uh, that's going to pinch them. And is this going to be sort of graded for by income or something? Because otherwise you're going to just allow people who have a lot of money to park in town and do their shopping, and everybody else won't. So I don't see any reason why it couldn't be, but this report does not address that yeah. question. That's going to be for your elected officials to set pricing relevant to whatever standards the community deems appropriate. Essentially what the report is saying is establish a flexible resident permit system that allows for parking options for non-permit vehicles by street, either none or one or two hours, schedule permit enforcement, non-resident employee permits, revenue set aside for improvements to that block and street, that's what Marina was just talking about, about uh, the fees that come out of your block, staying in your block, all right? And then that you establish easier for people to access a web portal for registration, transition away from the physical paper permits, and get the poor police out of the equation of making these judgment calls. Just one more point. Yes, I know people who live in this town who don't have internet access in their house. And so they come to this building and they do their internet work. So that's going to also uh, select them out of the people who can so actually... So they have a car, but they don't have internet? Yep. Okay. Well, they're going to have to figure out a solution for that? That's a choice. They and yeah. they could probably it's, have a... It's just an economic out, choice. If they have to drive the car, they need the car. They have a kiosk here in the library yeah. where they can register. All right. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, Joe, you had your hand. Do you know, as an elected official, we see that parking, the, the, it, this is a public asset. The streets and the management of the space is really um, a responsibility of the governing body. And I would encourage you to, uh, Donald Shoup is the, really the parking guru. If you want to do more research on current thinking about how to manage parking, I recommend that you um, look up Donald Shoup or just Google sort of the high cost of free parking. There's a seminal article, I think that's the title of it, that talks about some of the issues related to parking. And I understand your concern about possibly people who, in our community who can't afford the highest prices that might be charged for some of parking. We do try to make accommodations for them in various ways. And to someone who brought up someone who might need handicap parking, we also make those accommodations on, on the street. The governing body will um, often add a handicap spot in various locations by ordinance. Um, but I think when you think about the amount of revenue we raise through parking, that's money that's not raised through property taxes to cover our expenses, the other services that we provide. And to the extent that out-of-towners contribute to that when they come in to our sweet little town to do their shopping, that really is a benefit to our residents. And I hate to say trickle down, but there is some trickle down to um, people in our community when the governing body maximizes this tremendous asset that we have. Now, Sam brings up a good point. Do you want to maximize it for the use of cars, or are you going, you know, that's, that's certainly a dollar maximization, a return on investment, but you might also say that that isn't the measure you want to use when you're looking at that. 
asset and, and you want to value it some other way. And, and that might be for um, bicycles or whatever. Thank you, Joe. Jim. I think it's important that we all take a look back to where the parking problem came from for five seconds. And you know it's from having a vibrant downtown Princeton, which all of us were not in agreement about having about 20 years ago. Uh, when I saw reports that called for a vibrant downtown Princeton in the Board of Trustees me meeting minutes over in Mud Library. As a result of those, that word vibrant, which appeared in those chronicles, we relaxed the restaurant <coughs> ordinance. My father owned three different restaurants in towns at different times. I was aware that it was one table, uh, one park, uh, four, four spaces, uh, one, one parking space for each four seats in your restaurant. As soon as that was relaxed, all of a sudden you had those two peaks appear on your, on your parking in town at 12 to 2 and after and 5, 6, and 7 o'clock at night when the restaurants were full with people coming from the outside of Princeton inside to eat at our generous trough, which was great for our merchants, but not for the rest of us in terms of parking. So I have some qualms about a vibrant downtown Princeton because I don't see this place as stagnant. I see it light years ahead of Rollway and other places. It just happens we're not building currently right now. We are building some things, but we're not building as much as Rollway or the other places with smart growth. Are you happy with that? Can you be content with your parking spaces that you have now? I don't like the number of restaurants here, and I'll tell you why. Especially from the other night. I'm walking across the intersection of Van Devender and where it hits Park Place and Spring Street. I'm in the path. A car goes through on Van Devender to the other side of the walkway. I start across the walkway. He backs up as fast as possible because he spots a parking space <laughs> on Spring Street. Grazes the back of my pants as I dive out of the way. And I said to myself, is that another guy for Triumph Brewery who just had to have a space? <laughs> you know, those restaurants, we all pay a price for. And I blessed their little businesses because my father had one. But you know, that's what parking is largely about if you look at the peaks. So we need to, we need to think about do you decrease the number of restaurants in town or make it harder to have one? You don't want the rest of your buildings converted to restaurants, do you? Because you know, they're in, in terms of their income, 5% of, their, of, of what they, their actual costs are of running are for the materials they provide. They'll outdistance every other provide business on the street, and you'll have more restaurants, one in every building. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have a suggestion, but first I want to say that uh, because of the number of comments we've heard here, and because of the parking study, I feel optimistic about what can be done. Now, my suggestion has to do with the fact that there's so much data, so much information that has to be looked at, has to be put into some format or another, that we might consider asking Ice Gruber to give us some people from the Center for Information Technology to create some kind of a way of looking at all this data so that we can make wise evaluations about it. That's my suggestion. That's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, this has been um, really helpful. I live in the um, John Street, Jackson Anderson um, area, and I just would like people to remember that the houses that we live in were constructed in 1927. In, neighborhood where the least economically privileged people lived. They were not thinking about a driveway because cars were new and they were not the people in town who had them. 
So it's not our fault that we live in houses with no driveways. And that's what it often sounds like here, that we made a mistake when we bought <laughs> our houses. We didn't. And I'm very happy now that when the town works with people who are doing new construction or are modifying homes, that they require them to use space to do that. But it does seem in the neighborhood that has the least resources, where $30 does matter. And I want to say that because I fully believe what you said about the long-term view. I do believe we need that, that conversation. And I had a two-hour long conversation about parking in Zurich last week with experts about it. I do believe that. But in the immediate future, the people who live in my neighborhood, and I don't know if they're still with me, some of them were here and left, $30 means a lot to them. And knowing that we can park is important to us. Do we want to be part of the long-term sustainability? Yes. But hearing that this is our fault, and I've heard this now, this is probably my sixth parking meeting, is really feeling the haves versus the have-nots in a community that you open the conversation on, that one of the challenges is that we are not perceived as economically inviting. So, thank you. Well, I apologize if you think I said no, no, I didn't mean you. you I made you. a mistake, because I certainly did not mean to imply that. Yes, ma'am, to, to your right. Hi. Um, I, uh, I guess I'm in the minority. I, I live in town, I've lived in town for many years. I want a parking place outside on my street for when people come to visit. I don't want to figure out if I look it up on the computer to figure out how to borrow half an hour or three hours if they stay longer. I think everybody who lives in town deserves a place on the street in front of their house for free. Maybe not six, maybe not eight, except for those special occasions. But there's the guy who does the, the yards, the gardeners around town. There's tons of people who come and park on the street to do the work that they're doing on the street construction that's happening. It's not like, like you couldn't apply for six permits for construction that's happening. You don't know when these people will show up. It's, it, it's totally unworkable as far as I'm concerned in terms of predictability because my life is not predictable in that sense. I want on-street parking. I don't have to have a ton, but I want some on-street parking. I want to not have to consult somebody or consult the computer if I'm going to have somebody use it. When the grandkids come, I want to park on the street so they can play in the yard. I mean, it's just, it's far too complicated to me and I think you need to take that into consideration. You got 1,500 responses or so back from people in a town that has 25,000, am I wrong? 30. 30, I was gonna go for that next. Um, that's not a lot of responses about people and how they feel about parking. I, and it's not a matter of, here's how I feel about parking and I wanna make sure my position is represented. It's just not a lot of responses what a lot of people need. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. B and you and Mary, and then we're going to, oh, you've had your hand up. So last four, and then we're at noon time. So B, you go first, and you're going to go second, then. Just wanted to put in my two cents for public transit, which I try to do at your excellent meetings. Uh, I was disappointed that the advertisements I saw, while they did make some small reference to walkability and cycling, omitted public transit altogether. Um, I believe most of our elected officials would never be caught dead taking a local bus unless it's for a photo opportunity for a poorly designed line to the hospital which has since disappeared. Um, I would encourage people in the future as we elect officials to question them. What is your commitment to cycling, to pedestrian, to uh, public transit? Because that's part of the whole transportation mix and you know the, the comments about vitality of the town, I think most people would say they do want economic vitality, but it doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be just depending on automobiles. I see comments from local business people, whose businesses I do um, patronize, saying that we need more free parking to bring people in during the holidays. These are businesses where I've spent thousands of dollars on foot, on bicycle, on bus, getting to and from their, their businesses. Where is, is, the, is the council's uh, and possibly the consultant's mind in terms of suggesting to these businesses, in your ads in the papers or elsewhere, mention what bus line you're on. Give a little discount. I mean, these are simple, simple things that in Princeton, we just don't, it's not even on our radar. Yeah, and, and, and so, basically, thank you for, I want to say to the elected officials, thanks for even showing up. It's really much appreciated. And uh, I mean, 
discussion about the zoning code? Okay. You say here, yep. zoning code is not mentioned. Correct. You're right. Not at five after twelve. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Mary. I just keep thinking about all the people who have garages that are filled with stuff and can't park their cars in them. We have a town wide yard sale. Everything. Uh, <laughs> the garages. You, sir, in the back. Do you want me to have the mic or not? Yes, Sheldon, would you please? All right, thank you. Hola, muchas gracias por la comida. Hi there. I have like three points. One's just a technical point. So I've lived in a number of cities where parking has been an extremely bad problem. Yep. This is the only time I've ever lived in where it was on a street by street basis. Usually there's a there's an area, and so I was surprised reading the report that still was still sticking to street by street basis. So I would suggest people think about that because it's one street over, like I used to live on Chestnut Street, Chestnut, Maple Pine. They're all pretty much sharing the same problem. So I, I'm, I worry if the suggestion would be for that on a street by street basis, we we'll make different parking decisions. So I think that would help with that. Um, the comment that was just made before, um, I moved to Princeton like 20 some years ago, and I remember parking was a problem from the very first start. I went to a meeting, and I just remember that first meeting, it was the first time I got involved at, at all in government. I was told, it's your fault that you chose to buy a house that didn't have a driveway. Because oh. uh, I was coming from a place where no one had driveways. I didn't even think about it. And they said, you were trying to cheat the system by paying less taxes. And I just was staring at the person like, are you kidding me? And then afterwards, every time we have this tax assessments, um, I've gone there, and I know we're not doing the major ones. Each time, my taxes have come out the same time as the people who had driveways. And so I've had to file all these um, tax appeals. and so. There is this popular imagination that the people without drivers are somehow gaming the system. Yeah, and I'll just yeah, say, based you. upon me, um, yeah. my experience, I was never trying to game the system. It was a smaller house. It seemed like it was a good place. Um, and I would just hopefully that type of um, comments which seem to show up from time to time can be eliminated. Because I think, as the woman said before, I think everyone would love to have a driveway if they could. It wasn't necessarily economically possible when I moved to the town for me to be able to do that. Um, and I think you should keep that in perspective. Mm -hmm. And the last thing about the cars and businesses, I'll just say, um, I certainly bike to business, lot of businesses and bought things. I've also driven downtown at times, even when I was on Chestnut Street to buy stuff. Um, I think businesses need, need some accessibility. So I think we don't want to ban cars. Certainly we have the, the garage there that's important. And we should just keep that in mind. We want to keep, maybe we don't want to be as vibrant as Jim says in downtown, but I think we do want to make sure we support our local businesses since so many of them have been Closing up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, I didn't go into any detail, but the report does provide strategies for businesses to incentivize their customers to uh, have discounts on transit, and also businesses can pay for your parking. So when they say they want free parking, the report says, okay, Mr. or Miss Business Person, you pay for your customers' free parking, not the taxpayers of Princeton. I want to thank you all very much for coming out today. This is a great beginning. Uh, this will be in front of council on Monday night, December 11th. Is that correct? Do you know if that's still the case? <laughs> It's not a good time for business. I disagree with this. I think we've got to So, so everybody stay tuned. The next step in this process is that this report will go to the town council and they will vote to basically just accept the report as complete. They won't be taking any action on instituting fees or charges or changing meters. But that will probably follow next year. So stay tuned. Happy holidays, everybody.